What's up, people? I'm back. Another episode of Young and Ignorant. Again, I'm, I'm still open to changing the name of this. If anybody thinks they have a better one, I'm, I'm always open to suggestions and criticism and all that stuff. But we're back. Another episode. Finally, after a long hiatus. Uh, obviously, some stuff happened. And I've been working my ass off. And I just... You know, I got really busy and I just didn't have time to reach out to people and get connections on and all that stuff. So I put that aside for a little bit, but it's only been a few months. It's not like it's been a year or anything. Uh, but I did say from the start that I was going to start this for my own, just like being my own thing. I know, you know, I work for other people. I do my own things and help them grow their presence. But I kind of want to start building my own presence, my own things. Uh, I need to be more out there on like socials and stuff. I, I'm just always promoting my other stuff, but not my own. So like TikTok starting to get in more like my own TikTok. Obviously I'm doing stay cashing. I've grown 5,000 followers in a month on there. And I'm just, I started thinking to myself, like if I'm doing this for other people, I can't, why am I not doing it for myself? So that's that's what I'm going to start doing and hopefully I can get enough connections on here. I got a list of people. Um obviously right now <clears throat> great conversation with Josta. He's w one of the best guys you'll ever meet. Uh we talk about the stereotypes of death <laughs> death metal singers. Um but this guy's he's great through and through. He's always treated me with respect and perfectly. He's the dude's just an awesome guy. I think you guys will love him and his stories. His story is crazy how he got started in it and all that. So this this one's a banger. But as for me, I know I know there's a, there's an elephant in the room, which I have decided. Thought 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 pretty hard about this. I'm not gonna address it. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not really one to air my grievances. Or my dirty laundry out. So I'm just going to leave it like that. Um, I will say one thing. And I'll leave it. I won't take questions. I won't answer nothing about it. But take everything you hear with a grain of salt. That's what I'll say. But in other news, I've been reading this great book every day. It's literally one page a day. Dated. So today's March 17th. Read it every morning. This makes you think a little bit. It's called The Daily Stoic. Sorry. Shout out Austin for putting me on. It's great to just start thinking. It's like, you know, a couple of days ago, they were like, what are the things you have that are superfluous? I think that's how you say it. Superfluous? Something something like that. Regardless, it's, that means like, what, what what stuff do you have that you don't, you don't need? Um, I'm trying to think of an example right here. Like, I bought these glasses for... St. Patrick's Day, stupid little glasses. Do I need them? No. Could I live without them? Yeah. But that's just an example. That was honestly kind of a terrible example. But this this book is really good. And if you guys are interested in, you know, starting your day off and thinking like deeper and surface level and kind of appreciating life more, I think you guys should get into it. Um, but yeah, that's really all I'm going to say is that we got a lot of big things coming. I've been working with MMA fighters, um, talking to UFC guys, the guys on ESPN, musicians, artists, well, so many, so many people and so many connections I've made over the past couple months that I haven't been doing this that could possibly be guests. And if you're interested in coming on, I'll, I'll interview anybody, honestly. So if you're interested in coming on, hit me up. We'll, we'll get you on if you got a cool story. Hell yeah. Um, but that's that. We have a, a fantastic conversation with Josta. I know I touched on it a little bit. I don't really want to spoil it at all. I just kind of, I asked this man a few questions and he, he, uh, he took off with it and he gave some really insightful answers. Um, it's, it's, it was a really good conversation. Great guy, great person. So I'm going to leave it at that. Enjoy it. Please like this, subscribe, leave a comment, share, retweet, post. 
do whatever you want. I'm trying to get more out there, you know, just kind of let myself do it. If I'm doing it, I'm doing it. So feel free to do it uh, and leave a review on Apple. We're back up. I'm paying for it. <laughs> All right. I'll shut up. Jamie Josta. Here he is. All right, everybody. We are here with the legend himself, Jamie Josta. Good friend of mine. Jamie, how's it going? What up, Ev? Good, man. Thanks for having me. No, I'm happy to have you here. Uh, this, this podcast has been dormant for a while, so to get it back up and have you on as a guest is uh, just a great pleasure. Can't thank you enough. Oh, well, the pleasure's mine, man. I appreciate all your help. I was just talking about you on the Patreon show. Oh, shit. Yeah. Saying that we're going to get this fan section up on the on jamiejosta.com. People are psyched. We posted a new song on Patreon yesterday for the new album, new Josta album, and so far so good the reactions are good so i really appreciate all your help man yeah i mean i'm happy to work on it too i, I got to work on my first album release with corpse grinders new album and you got me involved in that and now the and for all album is going to come out i'm going to work on that too and just everything going on with pmg is I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it yeah man it's great and and big things ahead i think this corpse grinder vinyl is going to go crazy i thought the cds i mean i had to hire more people on just to handle the cds and the cassettes so anybody that was out there saying physical media is dead i mean no <laughs> it's like it's considered it, vintage now but like that people love that stuff like record players and everything yeah cassette players are coming back vcr <laughs> players are coming back i couldn't believe that because really? i'm pretty big on depop uh -huh. And I follow a bunch of like resellers and thrifters because they can find a bunch of shit from my collection back in the day, like old death metal shirts and old records that it's super hard for me to find. And I don't have a lot of time to go to record stores when I'm on the road. I try to, but then I don't always have my list with me of like, uh, you know, which one do I own on this yeah. color or whatever. And I don't have a huge collection, but the tangible when you're a fan, having that tangible, that real, mm -hmm. something you can hold, something you can look through there. And, and and that was what was so cool about working on Course Grinder. Like we gave the kids a chance for them to be in the fucking yeah. album thanks list. <laughs> and there, dude, like obviously I'm the one doing the album and like all the all the lists. And there's I shit you not, there's like five hundred names on that on that list. Which is crazy. And they're so like, psyched. Yeah the amount of people that like backed him and you know just supported the album they literally got their name enshrined in his history of his discography so i mean shout out to them and shout out to you guys for doing that yeah no it, it's been fun and, and dude this morning i was like when i get up i try not to check the phone like too early That's but smart. i give myself an hour maybe an hour and a half before i check the phone but I knew we were going to have this amazing weather today and we've had a little bit of a cold snap Beautiful. and I thought I'm going to walk my girl to work because I just got this new place and it's closer to her work and and I, I thought oh I'll get the dogs ready and I'll go down there and I'm like let me check the weather and I'm checking the weather and I'm like let me check Twitter real quick because I follow a couple like the weather people yeah. <laughs> from my area on Twitter that's how you know you're getting old like you, yeah. you probably <laughs> you're excited about the weather you're like shit it's going to be 60 today dude <laughs> yeah exactly and I saw the weather person for one of the local stations was tweeting about physical media and was tweeting about a record store that I used to go to, that I went to signings at. I think even Hatebreed had a signing there, like 20. The store was called uh, Strawberries. It's before your time, but yeah, it, would be. it was. <laughs> we did a signing there, I think, in 2003 or 2002. So it was funny for her to see her talking about this. And then she said, how crazy is it that CD sales are up 17% this year? Really? <laughs> so if the weather person is talking about it now, it's, I think like, that's pretty crazy to see it completely turn around from, you know, Best Buy pretty much getting rid of 90% of their music, mm -hmm. Walmart, Target, all the big chain stores downsizing their music section to now seeing it go back up 17%. It's it's just cool because I, I I mean I'm sure you know whoever's listening to this knows we've we've said all we could say about streaming. I back streaming because I own my masters, but I I understand when the when the older artists are bombed yeah. that they're not making a lot on streaming. But it's because they need to renegotiate their deals or they need to re-record 
those classic songs and those classic records so that way people stream their version of it and they can collect more on it yeah like taylor swift is doing you saw taylor swift is doing that no i didn't see that but i mean she's even a newer artist so that's that's surprising yeah well she's she got wise to the game quick and when the when that dude bought her masters she was like all right then i'm just going to re-record them because she, she's never going to oh, gain yeah, ownership back yeah 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 that's so cool. now if you were taylor swift and you owned your master and you made a direct deal with spotify or you got like grandfathered in with apple you're getting that joe rogan deal you're game it's game over you're yeah. getting that fuck you money i mean she already had fuck you money i'm sure but um you know coming from punk and hardcore it was always like a dirty word to talk about the money aspect of it mm -hmm. but i was always like we have to be able to survive and we have to be able to get our fair share and owning sense. your master and re-recording your bigger songs not only ensures that you do that but you then control your your master so if you want to if someone wants to license your song say for a car commercial or whatever and you want to license them your version it's the same you know it's so set back in the ad wouldn't you rather your version be in there so you don't have to split it with the record company who you who don't even know anybody that works there anymore of course <laughs> it's that you, you're making the the media not centralized it's it's you, you own it it's, you own it but speaking of music and stuff i don't know a lot of people who are watching this they might not know who you are um if you want to give them Super quick rundown, lead singer, artist, producer. You, you literally do so many stuff, so you can just give a quick synopsis of what you do, who you are. That'd yeah, I sing in Hate Breed. I have my other band, Josta, which is um, the Belmore Brothers, who also play in D. Snyder's band. I produce the last two D. Snyder albums. I do the Josta Show podcast. I run Perseverance Music Group or Media Group now that we're launching the podcast network. And, um, we're going to sign other podcasts and we're going to do all sorts of other projects, audio books and things like that. Um, and yeah, I've been in the game. I was a former TV show host. I got into podcasting in 2014, got over 600 episodes of my own. And then I do a movie podcast and I'm, I'm getting ready to launch this riff beast podcast, which is going to be really guitar centric, but not just metal. Mm -hmm. um, and that, happened recently because i've had like george lynch and joe satriani and a uh, bunch of guitar legends on the josta show but i thought wow we could do so much more with this content whole other show yeah and we could really you know dial in the segments and talk about our favorite riffs talk about our favorite albums talk about the albums certain artists have that are you know the most chock full of riffs and uh and i got so many great talented people by me now that i'm thinking let's showcase the guitar players i i get asked that a lot like hey if you hear anybody that needs a drummer a guitar player a bass player put my name in the mix and um i think that's going to be sort of like the main goal for the new podcast and the new podcast network is like showcase the talent and but also showcase the hustle right like of course i used to think hustle be, be talent all the time but if you have both hustle and talent yeah or you or you have someone who's all talent but doesn't have the hustle but you have the hustle and you guys can work together good then that could be a match made in heaven too and you know that's that's kind of how i got with george to do the corpse grinder record i'm mm -hmm. like dude no one has a voice like this like you have the craziest death metal you have the best death metal voice yeah. ever the, and the the amount of people who praise that man like he's a god is crazy yeah because it's and, and it's talent is is also subjective, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're in this new um, like this new era where anybody who's got a lane can showcase it on any one of these platforms. Yep. And if you have a magnetic personality or if you have a talent that's unique, it doesn't even have to be a talent that's um, necessarily complemented by mainstream society something as as crazy as death metal being able to make your voice sound like a fucking lunatic demon <laughs> it is a talent and that's why i love music it's like people could listen to the sex pistols or the ramones and they go oh, this is so simple it's three chords but yeah but can you write Insane. the hits like they wrote mm -hmm. 
And speaking of Can like you, society, this is kind of off off topic, but on topic at the same time. But people have these like misconception of like death metal and all these guys. They think that they are just the grimiest, like just dirtiest, mean motherfuckers. But meanwhile, I meet you and I talk to George a little bit, and you guys are like literally the nicest people I've ever met, which is just crazy. <laughs> it just totally goes against the the misconception that the public has about like death metal and stuff. Yeah, totally. And yeah, death metal and hardcore, because back in the day, it was those guys that were the ones that like had the face tattoos and piercings. And yeah, and were really sort of on the outskirts of society, didn't go to regular concerts, didn't go to bars, weren't into sports, you know, didn't keep up with the status quo. But slowly, we've been able to branch off into and, and get into the not so much the mainstream, obviously, Cannibal Corpse before George was in the band was in like Ace Ventura and was the highest selling death metal band. Um, and, and with Hatebreed, hey you know, we were on universal. We were, I had a show on MTV too. It was yep. pretty mainstream, even though it was Saturday nights at whatever midnight or whatever, it was still a show. It was, yeah, it was a real TV show. Yep. And, and, uh, but I think 99% of the game is just showing up. And then also, being able to outlast not necessarily the competition but just the trends in general and the 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 peaks and valleys like if you can get through them and then as some drop off when we hit a valley that's when you go a little bit harder yeah. right and that's and, uh, that's, that's kind of what I, I wanted to get into some of that too and like you had uh you had your previous music label uh stillborn records but then obviously you rebranded that into perseverance media group or music group whatever you want to call it now that's what we were talking about pmg um does that is that like a a personal thing or did they just pick a word or does it like resonate or what is that yeah well with with stillborn records it was something i named when i was 14 <laughs> i had a demo tape and we were talking about the demo tape and we we're like, well, we, when we send this to labels and when we send this to promoters, we want us, we want it to seem like we have our shit together. We want it to seem like we have our own label, mm -hmm. right? Because then we would come off as being more pro yeah. and perception becomes reality, right? Like if you fake it till you make come it off, yeah, right. If you come off as pro, all of a sudden people consider you a pro mm -hmm. and that, and that's what happened. But I noticed that, once I got the records into the big chain stores and once I got a distribution deal with Caroline, which is, you know, parent company was EMI, I noticed that people were searching out stillborn because they had had stillborn children. And then they'd stumble upon the site and they'd go, why would you name a record label after this? This is like the worst thing that ever happened to me. And we would get all sorts of hate mail and threats. And, but when the, when the writing was on the wall, that, downloading and Napster and all that stuff had really, I guess, hurt sales and hurt pre-orders and, and just hurt the physical business. I was like, no, we're in the Valley. We got to go strong. And I wrote it until like 2008, 2009, but that's when the recession hit. And that's when the physical media really fell off the edge of a cliff yeah. and I just shut everything down. And I wish that I had, you know, stayed the course then but it was also a good learning lesson for me because i gave a lot of the groups back their masters it wasn't you know it was a loss but it wasn't like a such a detrimental loss it took me a, a a lot of years to make it back and to make good with some of the artists but it it was one of those things that it gave me the the insight to be like okay instead of trying to break these other artists why don't i just focus on my own career and i think that's you know people were People have been asking me, I mean, I didn't get the first, I got the first Joss out in 2011. So that first two years of not doing the label gave me the chance to get the guest spots on that record. Cause I had Randy from Lamb of God on that record. I had, I mean, it was a lot of work. Yeah. Um, but then six years goes by, I put, to, put out two Haybreed records and I put out a Kingdom of Sorrow record. And I started thinking, man, imagine if these records were on my own label, especially especially divinity of purpose and concrete confessional which both had some really big songs on it concrete confessional has our biggest song on it which came out in 2016. if i had put that out on my own it would have been millions 
you know, okay. instead of a couple hundred grand or whatever it was that we got that we had to split up. So it made me think, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe I do need to really focus on trying to, you know, get a knowledgeable staff, keep up with the current, I guess, internet platforms, right? Because it's all new TuneCore, mm -hmm. uh, Bandcamp. I mean, Bandcamp is amazing. You, you guys use it literally every every email I get from you is just like, oh, it's Bandcamp Friday. Oh, do this on Bandcamp. We got a new link, a new landing page. Like, clearly it's good for artists and you guys want to push it as well. So you get sales from that too. Yeah. And if we had Bandcamp in like 2008, 2009, game over, man. It would have been, yeah. <laughs> and I had heard of, major artists or are indie artists that signed to majors that like ed sheeran i had i had flown out to columbus to see his last club show before he like really blew up yep. he was already like blowing up blowing up but actually it was cincinnati at bogart's shout out to bogart's the staff put my daughter was really little then but they put us up in the vip watched the show and then i was talking to somebody who was working with him afterwards and they said oh yeah like he just logged in to one of his, you know, like SoundCloud or one of these, these platforms where like CD baby, or I don't know what it was, but it was one of those platforms where if you're an indie artist, you can sell your MP3s and sell your CDs. Mm -hmm. And he had like $2 million in there. <laughs> oh my God. Oh. Yeah. He's the type of guy that just seems like he would have no idea that happened. Like he'd probably left yeah. the dormant for like two years. And he just had no idea that there was that much money in there. Yeah. And that's what I did with the Jostle from 2019. I didn't really log in for a while. And then when I did, I was like, holy shit. Yeah. Cause I had some big songs on there, like big in, in my world, not like big in the mainstream world, but like, one of the singles strength to draw the line on just Spotify. It has, I think maybe two or 3 million or two, 2.5 million streams. But for me, that's huge because I own the master. Yeah. So if you're making like nine, 10, 11, 12 grand off a million streams, you know, and you're putting out a bunch of singles, you can, especially if you could get them on playlists and you can get them on Sirius satellite radio mm -hmm. and you can get them, um, even onto like a couple small soundtracks and stuff. Like I have this one song that's on a trauma film soundtrack. I have another one that uh, Frankie Kazarian, big shout out to Frankie Kaz. Um, he uses in AEW as his entrance music. So whenever he comes out to that, boom, you, get, you see it on the band camp, yeah. you see it on TuneCore, you see it on the lyric video people, then people buy a shirt. And so it's an exciting time if you're, an established artist if you're an indie artist if you're an upcoming artist because you're you just have more say and more power yeah so i kind of wanted to get into like i asked this question with most people like when you're younger you know how everybody's like i want to be a fireman an astronaut a doctor whatever it is like i feel like when you're a kid you're not just like i want to be a death metal singer or i want to host <laughs> mtv's headbanger ball or like obviously you wouldn't know this but like you worked with one of the greatest rock stars of all time, D Snyder, and you still, you produced his last album too. Like how, what did you want to be? Where'd you go? Like, what did you do for school? How, how the hell did this come about basically? Well, I knew that I couldn't do what everybody else was doing. I just couldn't, I didn't have, I couldn't see the value and I, I couldn't, it, it was of, no interest to me whatever i tried to do as far as like odd jobs um i had worked as a line cook i'd worked as a prep cook i worked as a dishwasher i worked at a screen printing place i worked at uh uh i mean i went to a camp that was for like at risk um youth i went into like a, a program at this school where they bus you off to another school, which was really weird. Back in the 80s, they called it TAG, but they were taking all this data and they were going through your tests. Mm -hmm. And now I look back on it and I go, whoa, they were, you know, because my girlfriend's a teacher and she says they're collecting data on preschoolers and kindergartners now, like who has behavior problems, who, 
who is going to, or, you know, who's excelling in math and right. writing and reading. And so I must have had something in a certain area where they said, okay, <laughs> we're going to bus you to this other school and we're going to monitor basically. you and we're, and we're going to do these like, yeah. And then when I got into, uh, I, I, I couldn't go to a regular high school. So I got into this, um, like a non-traditional school and I got blamed for some graffiti. Now I was there, but I didn't do it and I wasn't going to snitch. Uh -huh. um, one of the kids at the time, his brother was big in um, uh, Latin Kings and his brother was older than him. His brother was like six, seven years older than him. Yep. And because they had tagged that, I was like, there's no way I'm messing with these dudes. You know, like there's no way I would snitch. And then when I didn't snitch and I got expelled, I lived very close to this kid too. Um, he, he was like, yo, you made the right decision, blah, blah, blah. But I was like, yo, I'm fucking screwed now. Like yeah. I can't like, like I have to go get a GED. Uh -huh. Like this looks terrible. Like my father, my mother, like my, my aunts, my uncles, like people were like my grandpa, they were like, how did you get expelled like this is this is bad and um i guess when i went to the guidance counselor they said well we're gonna uh if you're gonna get your ged we're gonna we're gonna make it so that it basically looks like you quit and we didn't expel you but you're you're uh you're not welcome back basically <laughs> so but it was okay because when i was telling the guidance counselor i'm like i, I want to know like how do you book a tour how do you get signed to a record label? Like, how do you read these contracts? How do you read royalty statements? And no one knew. Hmm. There was no schooling for that. There was no education for that. They didn't even tell you how to do, like, balance a checkbook. Or even in they home act, there wasn't. They don't, right? No. Yeah, see, this blows my mind. So I started thinking... Well, what is it that you want us to do? And then, you know, when, did you ever go to a job fair? Yeah, maybe like one or two. Okay, so we I went to one. We got bussed into another school. And I was real skeptical of it. And I thought, man, it's like, it's like they want us to, like, make their clothes or flip their burgers or, or join, especially in New Haven. There wasn't a lot of options. People I knew, my sister's age and older, they had – some had gone into the service and went to the Gulf War. Mm -hmm. Some had, um, you know, pursued a life of crime. <laughs> Some people had joined gangs, you know, things like that. So I was just like, man, I can't do any of this shit. I want to, I want to, I like music. I want to go on the road. I want to, mm -hmm. I want to set up concerts. I want to be a promoter. And my father saw that and he was like, all right, let's let, I'll help you figure it out. So, he took me to this parks and rec department because we saw bands playing on the green and we just went up and we asked, how did you set this up? And that's the one thing that really resonated with me with me back in the early, early days was that successful people are willing to share for the most part, like how they right. do things and their process. Not all, some of them are like, no, I, I had to, go through hell right. you got to too yeah. i'm not gonna fucking hold your hand through it and i get that but this guy was like oh i just went and got a permit and then i rent to pa and then i got the bands and it was just got my friend's bands and we started playing and, I, and to me it was a big deal because i couldn't get the bar owners to call me back i couldn't get the clubs to call me back and then the cool guy like seen bands you know they're like who's this fucking 13 14 year old kid is like blowing up my phone <laughs> I don't want to book his little silly band, you know, because they were like older than us and they were playing bars and stuff. Yeah. But I knew if I was go to go into the city and hand out flyers to anybody who had a metal shirt or a punk rock shirt on, I knew if it was a free show, they would probably come check it out for the fuck of it. What else was there to do? And that's how you, like, that's what, how you grew from there? Yeah. L luckily, my father co-signed to get me the permit. Mm -hmm. Um. But then I just, I found a sound guy. I found some bands to play and we did it. And dude, like a hundred people showed up on the green, on the New Haven green. And we played a fucking show outdoors for free. 
So that was just the start of your entire career, and then ending up what Hate Breed is now, and all, and you yourself as an artist. Yeah, I mean that was that was the pivotal moment because I thought you got to do it. You you can't just talk about it. Like you you have to. And and then if someone's blocking you from doing it, you have to find another lane. It's and that was hustle. the lane. Yeah, and so then when people saw that kids showed up and we sold some tapes and stuff that's when the bands who had turned down the show started to hit me back like oh what are you planning and i was like i found a vfw that'll rent us out so anybody that was like big timing me that was like you know local yeah yokel band they started going oh this kid he puts his money where his mouth is he he actually like hustles and and can book some of the shows. And that's when I knew if I can't get on the show, I might as well book my own or be the show, you know? Yeah. And, and I would go to the bands after they'd get off stage and I would go, Hey, I, I'm, I'm trying to be a promoter. I know it's, I know I don't look the part, but could I book you on my own? And a lot of them would just blow me off. But then I would say, hey, I could probably pay you more because this guy and no offense to the old promoters, because a lot of them gave us opportunities, but they were skimming the door and you'd be like, yo, there's 400 people here. Can we get at least a dollar ahead? And yeah. they'd be like, no, here's 150 bucks. <laughs> and you're like, but you're charging six bucks or five bucks to get in. Yeah, I, I lost it, man. I don't know. Right. So I would go to the bands, especially the touring bands, and I would say, if you don't mind, like, what'd you get paid? And some bands, like bands I thought were famous, dude. Like bands that were on MTV, bands that were on Headbangers Ball. They would go, oh, we got paid 250 bucks. We got paid 500 bucks. So I started thinking, this is at like 14, 15 years old. I started thinking, I can make 500 bucks on a local show. Like, that's nothing. That's 100 people at $5 a head. Now, that doesn't include the flyers, which we would make at Kinko's. It doesn't include the rental. It doesn't include right. the PA. But I'd go to Daddy's Junkie Music. There you go. Buy a PA. And then that's just right. an asset at that point. So yeah, you basically vocal made PA. Just, you basically made a series of business decisions all throughout while you were 13, 14 years old that ultimately led you to be the best competitor, the best promoter out of anybody else. Yeah, I mean, there was times where I would outbid shows. I got major shows. I mean, I had I booked Rat, I booked I booked Guar, I booked Misfits with Michael Graves, I booked COC, I booked. Um, I mean, dude, I booked like My Chemical Romance. Someone was telling me, and I paid him like a hundred bucks. <laughs> I booked Newfound Glory, paid him a hundred bucks. What? That's then crazy. the bands would say they would say, "Hey, can you book our whole tour?" Like I booked Saves the Day. I booked their whole tour. That's um I gotta look that up. I was like, really? I was like, when did I book my chemical romance? They opened for Thursday or somebody, or they opened for It's crazy that you don't remember that. I got I guess someone someone was just telling me I was like, Are you sure they didn't just rent the room from me and another promoter booked it or something? I don't know. But I definitely remember the Newfound Glory show because it was, I think it was Newfound, Newfound Glory saves the day. And I, I know I have the posters here somewhere. I saved a lot of the flyers from the shows I booked, but that was another thing that I noticed when I would book shows. Like I booked SOD with Anthra with Charlie and, and Scott from Anthrax. And they would show up and be like, wait, so there's no PA? We're just going to have a vocal PA? And they were like, this is... This, this is sucks. insane, yeah. but it's punk rock. You know, it's like totally DIY punk rock. And then the crowd would go crazy and they would sell a ton of merch. And then it was like, wow, this wasn't that bad. And then you get a good name in recurring business. And that's that. Yeah. And Anthrax took, took uh just on tour like three, four years ago. It was one of the best tours I ever did sure. as, as, as Josta. But you see that when, when you go without, for so long you see these other lanes and i i that's that's something that i wish we could teach 
and I'm sure we could, like we might want to put out some sort of like intro to promotion or intro to booking or because we used to have this book called maximum rock and roll book your own life. And I would hit up everybody in the back of this book. And a lot of them would big time here. They would go, uh, you're too metal or you're too hardcore. You're too too punk. Like we're too hardcore punk for the metal promoters (laughs) Too metal for the metal for the hardcore promoters and the punk rock promoters. You know what I mean? So that's why you got to find your own lane. Yeah. So basically fuck it. You'll do it yourself, you know, but I know you're on a time jam here. So I got, three, maybe four questions to ask you. What was the point yeah, in your career where you had just like the biggest failure and you thought everything was just screwed, like you weren't going to get out of it? And how did you get out of it? Man, there's been so many. Um, You know, when we, when we were getting out of the first record deal, there was a bankruptcy and I... I didn't go through with it, luckily, because it would have screwed up my credit. Mm -hmm. But I needed to get all my business affairs in order. And I we owed a lot to the merch company because when you're on tour and you don't have tour support and you don't have a label that's supportive and they have weird accounting things where instead of getting royalties, they're like using it to like continue to promote their label and their other artists with your money. What? It's yeah, this is there's a lot of there was a lot of indie labels that would do these weird co-op advertising and things back in the day. But Mm -hmm. when I saw that Universal was willing to just buy us out, I thought, wow, so this is based off of widgets. It's based off of like, oh, they're going to sell X amount of units and we make like nine, ten dollars a unit. This is. I'm thinking like from universal standpoint and who knows, maybe they'll even sell more. Maybe they'll sell 500,000. Right. And I wish that I, I was more in the creative modes, but I wish that I thought like that back then, because at that time I was just trying to have a good record. I thought a good record changes everything, right? If you put out a shitty record and it flops, then you're coming from a point of weakness. Mm -hmm. But if you put out a banging record and it blows up or you get to that next tier level, then who knows? And because we didn't have a lot of capital and because I was, you know, thinking, oh man, I'm going to have to go bankrupt to get out of this deal and to, and then to not have to pay all these, you know, creditors. Yeah. I mean, dude, I had debt collectors calling my house every day, threatening me, threatening my girl, like yelling, screaming. And and uh, people were quitting the band. Like, it was hard to keep a drummer. It was hard to get people to come on the road. So then, you know, you're driving after the gig and you just played the gig. You sold the merch. You booked the show. You, you know, this is before GPS. You're reading a fucking map. You're lost. You're using a pay phone. And you'd just be exhausted, right? And when you're exhausted, when you're tired, you make bad decisions. When you're, when you're, and I was drinking still. Damn. And dude, I just put my nose to the grindstone. I would just try to get every last person to like listen. Can we, can we do a deal with this person? Can we do a deal with that person? I said, can I learn how to fucking, um, ingratiate myself with the booking agents and the managers and but even then you could be the coolest person you could be the nicest person you could be the best band if you don't offer them something right like if you're not gonna if you're not gonna sell tickets if you're not gonna sell records if you're not gonna um then then you know how are you gonna do it and we got home from i think it was the sepultura tour and we made a little money on that because we were in a van Sepultura helped us out. They were taking our gear in their truck or their trailer. And we would just reinvest, like buy more merch. And by the time we got out of the deal and got on Universal, we were getting offered like Slayer tours, Ozfest. And, you know, this was after people were like, you can't tour off a record for four years. We're like, well, we did. (laughs) We just did it. 
that's the very definition of perseverance though it's like it's all coming full circle like nothing is scarier than debt and be like even bankruptcy especially when it's your livelihood and your business and the fact that you just kept going with all that looming and then ended up here is that's incredible yeah and i and i saw like you know i gotta find out because i want to say that the bankruptcy attorney ended up working for the label that we were that 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 was trying to get me to stay in the deal and i that was another thing i saw like oh there's no loyalty in this <laughs> fucking business like there's like no. it's all about money for them right oh, so then cutthroat. right so you have to really know that and really learn that the hard way right and that's you can yeah. look at it as a loss but you can also look at it as like i mean dude there's no win or lose man it's it's all it's all win or learn right and i and that's that's something that i think about when i go all right we didn't get this tour like we just we were up for a big tour right before the pandemic um happened and we didn't get it and i felt like the old days when i would be crushed and i thought that's good because if you lose that feeling then you don't care it, and then then that coming that, out that of the pandemic leads, we got the snowball. megadeth tour yeah that's just a snowball effect of like if you don't care then you really don't care about like your product or your music or your art or your creativity and stuff so you need to stay invested within like like you were saying about your lawyer like as a like as a man in my 20s i mean obviously i'm more mature now than i was a couple of years ago but normally we all think that most people have the best intentions and they're looking out for you and stuff but really like when it comes down to it somebody's going to be looking after themselves and if it hurts you but benefits them they're probably going to be doing it and i'm sure that's the same thing that happened with your lawyer in that in that uh case but kind of backing yeah. off that or conversely to that question your biggest failure what was your biggest success in your career? I mean, there's been a lot. I mean, for us, we we just in the beginning we said we wanted to tour with Entombed, Sepultura, and Slayer, and and Agnostic Front and Madball, and we did all five. And then I remember um, Earth Crisis. I brought them down from Syracuse to play a show. They stayed at my old, I had my grandparents' house above their apartment they stay with me and my father and my uncle we were living above my grandparents and they were one of my favorite bands I'm like oh please if we ever do anything with the band please you know take us on tour and they took us on tour um and then when we got to we we did a headline tour i think in 96 or 97 it was either right before or right after the first album came out we got to um des moines iowa and these guys were in the front row they're singing their amash it wasn't a lot of people there and we go to the bar afterwards we're doing shots and um one of the dudes is like yeah i i'm i'm part of the venue here like i own the club and the other dude was like yeah and i'm in a band with him and they're like we got a demo we're, we're getting signed hopefully to roadrunner we go out to the van and listen to it and it's slipknot oh, shit. and i'm like yo this is sick this is like fucking slayer meets ministry meets fucking corn or i don't know what what I was like, if you guys blow up, you got to take us on tour. <laughs> did and they, they did. It? Dude, we, we, dude, two years later in 99, we're playing sold out arenas in fucking dude. North Dakota and Illinois and Iowa and with Slipknot. That That's we absurd. we were there when they got their gold records and stuff. And it was so cool to see somebody like that, like really blow up on the mainstream stage, but then want to take out underground, underground bands like us. Yeah, but and you were like one of the first people to like sample their work and already be have an established presence in the space. So that's, that's kind of crazy to me. Yeah, man, it was. And, and like, as they were blowing up, like they were the opening band on this tour. It was like, I think it was machine head cold chamber and they're playing 20 minutes and they came to Hartford and I went over there and I gave Joey and Paul a bunch of merch and I was, and I just watched so many people leave right after they played. The youngest kids, like the young kids, and they're wearing their stuff. They're wearing jumpsuits. They're waiting to talk to them. Like they, they were like, "There's no reentry." And I remember the kids going like, "Big fucking deal." Yeah. And I thought, "Oh shit, this is a changing of the guard, right?" Because Cold Chamber and, and Machine Head, like that, they they were kind of taking a little bit of a dip at that time. 
Mm-hmm. And so the kids were like going right to where the door was to hopefully get a glimpse of Slipknot. And it was a lot of fucking kids, dude. And I was like, this is the future. And so Joey, um, I left the box for Joey and then I get home, you know, an hour or two later and he calls me and he's like, dude, thank you so much. This shit is awesome. We're going to wrap it everywhere. He's like, who manages you guys? And I'm like, nobody, we need a manager. And he's like, well, I'm going to hook you up with a manager. And that Joey, God rest his soul. He got us our first manager. Damn. So a guy you you met when you were already established, then blew up, and then he got you a manager. So basically, you scratched his back, and he scratched yours two years later. Yeah, I mean, we dude, not like I. I mean, of course, I was talking about them in in interviews and stuff, and was supportive of them. But I didn't. That's the true measure of success is when you don't offer somebody anything, and they still treat you with love and respect. Yeah. And they were just like fans of heavy music. And they and they knew that we were busting our asses in the underground and we were you know, we had been an opening band at that point, you know, for many tours. And then they're you know, they had been getting done like we had been gotten done. You know, it's like, oh, set up your shit in front of all our shit, play in the barricade, like play in that little space between the barricade and the stage. You're the pity little opening band. And that's trial by fire. That's when you're like, all right, motherfucker, well, one day we'll be headlining, you know, over the people that make us do that. And they did that. They straight up, I'm, I mean, dude, you they eclipsed everybody. I mean, it was, and Rob Flynn from Machine Head, I mean, he talks about this very openly. That's, it's basically like a circle of life, it sounds like. Like, these artists come in or these bands come in, they're in the pit or wherever you said, but between the barricade, and then they eventually get up to be the headliner, but then there's somebody other than under them, and then they do that too, but it's great. Yeah, it's like paying dues, you that's know. That's what I'm saying, it's like a rite of passage. Yeah. And then, you know, you live and you learn and you just go, all right, if we ever get the headline, we probably won't make, we'll probably move our drum kit back a little bit (laughs) so they can have a little, you know what I mean? (laughs) So we're like a little bit of a dickhead, but like not too much of a dickhead. But (laughs) yeah, to, uh, to wrap this up here, I I ask the same question to every guest every time. If you could say, if you have, you have one message to somebody in like their young twenties or thirties, what, what would it be? Just keep showing up. I I say just keep showing up and just try to as much consistency as you can possibly have. And I, dude, I'm a firm believer in repetition, man. It's like I can't do anything without repetition. And that's why my music is like so repetitive because it needs to be a mantra in my ear. Like Mm -hmm. I need to keep telling myself over and over. And, um, like even today, we, you know, we're in there, we're packing orders. Like I'm not, and don't be above shit. Like, don't think you're above shit. Cause even now with a, with a new label, like I'm not a, I will be the mail person still to this day. Like I will go and pack orders and help these dudes. Like I'm not, I don't think I'm above that shit. And that's why when I see guys that are in major companies that get down and dirty like that, I I give them the credit. Cause that's a lot of times that's how it is now. Also, you got to be able to delegate and you got to be able to, you know, be a leader, work, work well with people. Yeah. But you have to, um, you know, I know people will say, oh, the, the CEO of McDonald's isn't flipping burgers. But <laughs> at, you don't know if at one point he was flipping burgers right. and he just worked that, you know, not I don't want I, McDonald's isn't the best example. Yeah, but you but know like, what I mean? Like not forgetting your roots, basically, and that you everybody's striving for the same exact thing. It shouldn't make you above them. Yeah, and just because you sell the most burgers doesn't mean it's the best burger, right? That's a fact. <laughs> so, you know, that's another thing I thought was like, yeah, we, especially in music, you don't have to shoot, you don't have to cast the widest web and try to be the most commercial band. You could be a crazy fucking death metal or hardcore band, but if you are willing to work to find the audience and you believe in what you do and you like and you listen to what you do, it's just like anybody else, like, if you're making something that you really like, you hope whether it's a burger or it's a fucking album, you hope that someone else is out there. That's going to like it as much as you do. Mm-hmm. It's all about the, the creative process and the art of what you're doing. That's why you take, you have passion in it, but yeah. And, and having a connection with it. So that way when people see it and they feel it, you know, it's genuine for sure. But 
thank you for coming on, man. I'll let you go to the, get to the office and get back to work packaging all that merch and those vinyls. But bro, I appreciate you. Yeah, anytime, brother. Thank you so much. Right back at you. Yeah, Howard just uh, Howard Jones just signed like a hundred LPs, so I'm going back over there to sign. He sang on one of the singles. I mean, the the record came out in 2017, but we just put out the vinyl. So, um, but people had pre ordered them like a year ago. <laughs> so it's it's fine it's it's cool to finally see it you know get the light of day it's it's amazing right and especially with that vinyl shortage you know it's a yeah. hot commodity right now it really is man it's crazy we they i was joking around i was like this is baby shit brown because we wanted all white vinyl but yeah. they were like nope we got to give you some on brown because we ran out of white <laughs> but now people want the brown more because it's the it's the it's there's like limited, it's the limited yeah, yeah. God damn. It is baby shit brown, though, if you look at it. <laughs> it just adds to the product. Makes it a better product. <laughs> exactly. But, all right. Thanks, guys, for listening. Hopefully, I'll be back next weekend and next week, not next weekend, and uh, maybe Jamie can hook me up with somebody. See you next yeah, week. Yeah, if you need a guest, let me know. Of course. Later, guys. All right, brother. Thank you.